<laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Minion channel. Tonight we're having another open session because, well, we don't have anyone to present any specific topic today, but uh, I think so, a lot of people appreciate these open sessions because, I don't know, we get to directly answer your questions. And a few of them have come in, and we have a few of them from last week. But as always, before we do that, uh, I am going to show off our image of the week, uh, which is N70 by Diego Colonello. Uh, and uh, this is another unfamiliar image to me, uh, I'm sure, because uh, it's in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, N70, it's a super bubble in the large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, a satellite galaxy to the uh, to the Milky Way system located in the southern sky at a distance of approximately 160,000 light years. Uh, it's a luminous bubble of interstellar gas measuring about 300 light years in diameter. Um, I'm not going to read the whole description to you. What I'd rather have you do is check it out on our website because then you can comment on it and actually see the image of it in full resolution. Uh, but uh, Diego did a great job on this one. Nice dark color, uh, and I don't know, just a really interesting object uh, stood out to me right off the bat. And uh, another cool thing about it is there are a few clusters in here that really just kind of scream out. And another, uh, I don't know, that's a planetary nebula, uh, but a, a nebula of some sort uh, in the in the corner right there. Just a cool image. Uh, so check it out. Comment on it. Or uh, while you're there, or and and or uh, submit your image. Click image of the week, and uh, you can see all the images that were submitted. You can drop down the bottom and submit your image here. Uh, that is it for image of the week. Congrats, Diego. Uh, let me see. Too many windows. Got it. Okay. Um, I am going to start, uh, first of all, like I said, uh, you guys post your questions in chat. Uh, maybe I didn't say that yet. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you can't take part in chat because we don't watch the YouTube chat. Uh, if you want to take part in chat, go to theastroimagingchannel.com and you'll see a little bouncing chat box on the bottom right. You can click that and basically log into chat, ask your questions ask uh, or comment on other people's questions, basically, then you're in. And you can also watch the uh, this session from there. Uh, it's all set up for you there. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, what uh, we hadn't got to last week uh, that I think we can manage to cover in a few minutes. Um, what I'll actually do is I'll read these out loud. If any of you have any specialty and think you might be able to present on any of these or know someone that could, uh, I know some people were suggested last week and I've commented a few, uh, contacted a few of them, but I only got a response from one or two, uh, and I'm working on getting them set up. But like I said, we're always looking for people. Uh, talk about ASCOM, and I know that's one of those things where it could either go really deep, really long, but uh, yeah, anyone has any um, deep knowledge of ASCOM, we'd love to have you on. Uh, exposure time. We've covered that a million times over. Um, let's see. These are the ones we've covered. Maybe I won't go through those. Uh, okay. Uh, this is one. This is a good one. Um, has anyone done the infrared cut filter mod themselves? To a DSLR, so in other words, uh, modifying your DSLR yourself to um, pick up the H alpha, uh, and uh, I, I I will say this: uh, I feel like I'm pretty technical, uh, but I watched one of the tutorials for uh, doing the modification, and uh, basically uh, he took out like eight screws opened up the camera, took out another eight screws, opened up the camera, took out another eight screws, then 10 screws, then a ribbon cable, then another 20 screws, keeping all the screws separate because they're all different types. Uh, and then over and over and over again. And I will tell you, um, I was ready to quit after the first page and there were like 20 more pages. So 
I was not brave enough to do it. And for what I think two or three hundred dollars at the time, I sent mine out to be modified. Uh, Gary Honus did mine. He's also the one that produced the tutorial. And uh, to me, that was money well spent because I could easily see myself just accidentally bumping that um, piece of paper that's holding uh, the uh, all the screws. And yes, I've seen this. I've seen this uh, suggestion before. Um, <clears throat> With, with the screws, print out a worksheet, apply double sticky tape, and stick the screws to the tape. And yeah, count it like in advance. Make sure you know how many screws you're supposed to have and make a little circle on it so that you've got a spot for each one. And I'll tell you, a lot of people have done it on the forums. And I can't say I've, I remember anyone saying I did it and I completely regret it because I really screwed it up. And then I sent it off to someone and they couldn't fix it. So. Can you do it? Probably, you know, it's just instructions. You just have to follow it. But at the same time, the guy, oh, the worksheet already tells you how many screws. There you go. Um, so that's even better. I guess, wow, we're getting more advanced these days. Uh, better than when it, back when I was considering trying it. But um, yeah, it literally says two short, one long. So it actually walks you through it uh, much, much better. Uh, we were just right before we came on. The other thing we were discussing is uh, taking uh, filters out of the filter wheel. And it seems like all the manufacturers, for some reason, have you using some tiny screwdriver right next to the filter. And I don't know, I guess I'm one of those people who are, uh, I, I, I don't want to say clumsy, but not delicate. Uh, and I, I can quickly mess a lot of stuff up. Uh, so I'm always uh, apprehensive about trying stuff like that. Um, probably more apprehensive than I deserve credit for because I, I could probably pull off a lot more than I would try. But uh, at the same time, that feeling of screwing something up real bad, I don't know. It's, it's nice to avoid that. Um, the... Next question, um, does anyone have one of the GSO trust tube imaging newts? And uh, I don't know if anyone in the room here does. I had spoken to someone who was demoing one uh, last NEF, and he was hoping to come on. I don't know if he's had luck, but uh, I can reach back out to him. Now, Mr. Mr. Jaffe, sir. Yes. Um, I actually have a 12-inch Wangsheng uh, optics uh, trust tube. Um, oh, it was the question about Newtonian or... or the newt, um, yes, not the... Newt, uh, not oh, okay, the yeah, okay, sorry. I've got an RC. So I think I'll slide back into the corner here. Yeah, the newts look really, really interesting. Um, I want to say... At 10 inches, they're like 32 pounds, and uh, probably, just looking at the design, very rigid. Uh, all of the, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't look like a budget Newtonian. It looks like a professional Newtonian. Uh, but that said, we need to get some good reviews on it and, and really be certain it, it can be collimated at those fast uh, focal lengths. Uh, in addition to that, uh, can it take a uh, something like a uh, what is it? The, is it the wind corrector that'll bring it down to f two point eight? Those are those would be questions that I have. Not so much can it take the corrector. Uh, is the collimation tolerance tight enough that it can be collimated with that corrector in it? Uh, I guess would be the uh, one of the things I'd be wondering. So if you have a GSO imaging newt, um, then uh, please uh, either send me an email review or something or, or send me an email and say I'd love to come on and talk about it because there are a lot of people that would be interested in that. Um, how does dithering affect dark frame subtraction? Um, if anyone wants to chime in in the room on this, uh, they're welcome to. Um, I've got to think about this for a Adam, second. Yes. Adam, um, we had a discussion a couple, three weeks now ago about statistics, mm -hmm. and um, it, there, a part of that was about dithering, and uh, 
uh, if you would like to go back to that discussion from three weeks ago, maybe two thirds of the way through it, we talked about um, where the hot pixels are and the cold pixels are and um, how you kind of line them up like that. Um, do you want me to just show those slides a little bit or what do you, your, just to refer them back to you that. know I, I think I'm just gonna refer them back to that unless uh, whoever asked this question I'm not sure how uh, specific you're referring how specific you want to get about it uh, but for a comprehensive uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> presentation on that definitely go back to Alex's uh, from just three weeks ago just just to, just to summarize in a, in a sentence or or eight um, imagine that you've got a hole right in the middle of a star and that hole is a black pixel and it's surrounded by a ring of brighter pixels now if you continue to take 10 subframes with all of those stars in exactly the same place on your uh, sensor, then you will have a black hole in the middle of each of those. You know, you have a cold pixel black hole in the middle of each of those stars. Instead, imagine that each time you take that picture, you move the sensor just ever so slightly. Now that black hole will be in a different place each time you take a picture. And then when you average out the values of the when you register those stars, then you will be moving the black pixel around. When you average it out, the black pixel pretty much disappears. That's the short form of how dithering works. But uh, there's some charts and graphs and illustrations uh, from three weeks ago, the presentation on statistics. Well, it, it seems to me that the question was related to how does dithering affect dark frames attraction? Is that the question? Yeah, that's that's no, where I'm a bit, overall noise. That's where I was a bit confused about the question too. Okay. Can we talk I, I about dithering I, with? It's both in chat and uh, in an email I got. Can we talk about what dithering does to the overall noise along with dark frames? Oh, I see. I see. Okay, because so, because I was thinking. Um, that the concern was, well, if you dither, you're moving things around, but the dark frames are static. In other words, the dark frames are tied to the absolute position of every pixel on the frame, whereas the dithering moves things around on the frame, but it doesn't move the pixels, right? So dithering as opposed to the dark frame subtraction has no, there, there's no tie there. In other words, your frame, your CCD pixels don't move, and and the the, the dark yeah. frame, the dark noise comes from the absolute pixels. So when you subtract the absolute pixels, you know the dithering doesn't have an effect. In it. That's what I thought the question was about. But I guess if it's tied to uh, the the matter of overall noise reduction, yeah, it's going to reduce your noise, right? Well, averaging reduces your noise because the noise is random and averaging eliminates some of that randomness. Um, so that's, that's what's the key to it. Uh, dithering itself doesn't change the amount of noise you're getting. And darks also have noise in them. Remember, noise is uncertainty about the value. And that uncertainty is caused by randomness of quantum fluctuation and um, things like that so um, it's uncertainty and you're moving the uncertainty around it, well but uncertainty is coming all the time from everything so um, dithering itself doesn't help with that what it does is get rid of the consistent defects yes yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to think about this because I'm kind of separating it up a little bit the uh, <clears throat> the dark frames kind of uh, technically are right, going to reduce the hot pixels, right? Um, or, or remove the hot pixels. Yeah. Uh, and then the actual dark frames, the subtraction of the dark frames is going to remove a little bit of the dark noise. Um, so you're kind of doing two different things 
uh, or removing two different types of noise. And the dithering also should uh, reduce, I'm trying to think about this, well, the, di the dithering also should reduce some of the, uh, the bias noise or the uh, uh, cor uh, uh, correlated noise. Um, well, Adam, Adam, I'm not sure it's reducing the noise because the it's it's if it's if it's consistent from one exposure to the next, I'm not so sure it's it's still noise because the noise is the is the randomness of it, the uncertainty in it. Well, it, um, it, the dithering does fixed pattern noise, right? Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that wouldn't be noise from uncertainty, right? That would be noise introduced to the system. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, at least that's how, that's where it's getting kind of uh, a It depends on your definition of noise. Right. So you're not getting a real good answer, Eli Elias. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're just not, Elias. You're not getting a good one because um, we're, we'd have to pin down the definition of noise itself. and um, It's complex. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're also asking a question that um, you're asking if dithering re itself reduces the noise. Uh, dithering gives you better data sets to average out. And in that sense, it helps. Um, and yeah. if you count noise as anything that's kind of disturbing the reality of it, dithering would help you do that but it's not necessarily just noise that it's removing. Well, I think, I think a lot of this is <clears throat> fine and dandy for intellectual discussion. The fact is, if you're just starting out and you don't know whether you should use dithering or not, use it. Use it. Yeah. Yeah, it does make and, a big deal. And then, and then when you're really bored and you've learned a lot of things about astroimaging, then go ahead and uh, you know, you can delve into the finer details of uh, of the hobby, but yeah, I think the question may maybe he's trying to decide whether um, <clears throat> he should go through the trouble of dithering, and I I would say yes, do it. I, I have a little functional example um, that I was just making in the background while we were talking. If you all want to see, sure. Um, yeah, we were just trying to give you time to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, all right, so you can do you see my screen, Adam? Yes. All right, so uh, what I've done is I've taken just a, a synthetic star field here, right? And I've cropped it down a little bit. So I just have a little uh, dynamic crop process here. Um, and I applied it, and I just moved the center of this around a little bit. So I kept the size the same, moved it a little bit, and did this uh, multiple times to make all these different frames we see off in the corner. And that's just to offset the stars in each of those frames, just like you would have when you're dithering. And then each of those, I've added some hot pixels with a little pixel math stacked up process here. And what I've got here in this picture, if I zoom out um, a ways, is there are all these stars and everything in here. So you can see all the stars in here, but you can also see there's a couple of these hot pixels. And these hot pixels are in the same location in every frame, just like they would be in the sensor. So if I, uh, uh, let's see. It's the same size and then apply the same field of view. So this is the same field of view between the two. You see the stars are not aligned, but that hot pixel is. So that's the important part. That's what happens on your sensors when you're dithering around. The stars and everything won't be in the same place, but your hot pixels will. So when you register them, so I'm going to take this image, uh, make it the same field of view over here. So when you register them, um, this is the unregistered frame here. So this is the original uh, frame. This is the unregistered. And you can see that those hot pixels line up perfectly. But after I register the stars, this hot pixel at the same field of view no, no longer lined up. It lands in a different location. 
And because of that, because these are landing in a different location for every single frame in this stack, when we go to combine them, A, they'll average out some if you're not doing any kind of rejection. But you can see that this guy, his values are so much different than all the others uh, in every one of these frames. So um, this guy is a value of 1.0. And then if you look at the, the value at the same location in every single frame after it's registered, it will be you know, slightly off. It'll be in one of the other locations nearby. And those values are all, you know, 0 0.0004, 0 0.003, 0 0.005, very, very low. So it's easy to identify this one as an outlier when you start looking at the whole set. And that, that gets back to Alex's discussion about statistics. It's very easy to reject that one. So that's how these things step around and why the statistics allow it to get rejected easily. That was a great illustration, David. Oh, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, next question. I'm glad this I'm glad this one popped in front of me. Uh, this is in the email, and I missed a lot of these last week. I just couldn't keep up with them. Um, anybody sell their photos and what goes into it? So there's actually a lot of different ways to sell your photos. And I've sold a few of my photos, and I actually got lucky and sold one this week. Uh, but I am in a unique position. Uh, I own a furniture store, and uh, I basically use them in our displays, and we sell artwork, so it just kind of makes sense. Uh, that said, um, if you want to sell your photos, obviously you can – there are a few different ways to try selling them online uh, in uh, – uh, it's basically really a place where they allow photographers to post their photos online, then they print them and they sell them to, and send them to your clients. Uh, all sorts, it's like very automated, um, but it's kind of impersonal. Uh, what I actually prefer to do myself uh, is, uh, I've said this before, I tend to donate a lot of my photos to uh, my child's school events, uh, to, uh, any sorts of charities or anything like that that uh, if they're if they're looking for anything uh, I say hey well this is what I do and they're usually glad to take it for a raffle or whatever it may be uh, and every time I give one away I end up selling one to someone who happens to see it and I just discuss it with them and they're just blown away by it uh, or even if I don't sell an image um, I end up talking a few people into visiting our local observatory, or I just get to chat with them about astronomy for a little bit. And uh, whenever I see those same people out on the street somewhere, they always catch back up to me and say, hey, you remember that time you told me to go here? Well, I went to the observatory. It was amazing. I brought my kids. So it's a really nice way uh, for those of us who take uh, pretty pictures to kind of use those in some sort of uh, impromptu outreach without bringing our telescopes and bringing all of this stuff. Um, third potential way to sell your uh, photography is, and uh, a local um, astronomer, astrophotographer did this, and I thought it was just kind of ingenious. Uh, he was doing sidewalk astronomy. He brought his telescope out onto the sidewalk, and he was letting people look through it. Uh, I think it was a solar telescope. And he happened to do it in front of an art gallery. And the art gallery uh, walked, the art gallery owner walked up to him and asked him if he wanted to do a present, like a, a, a whole uh, display. And um, he ended up doing that. So one thing I say to people when they say I want to sell my photography is um, if you, if you want to make a ton of money, uh, yeah, you're probably not going to do that. Uh, but if you want to just kind of have fun and, and represent it proudly and uh, have chats with people, uh, basically just go out and do that, and uh, you're probably going to sell some. Just kind of throw it in there that you sell your photography. Now, in the past, uh, we have um, had programs on how to print your astrophotography. And I do think that a lot of the interesting printing methods really help to sell it. Um, what I sold this past week was a gallery wrap. So it's basically <clears throat> canvas wrapped and stretched around the stretcher. 
um, and I do a uh, I do a one and a half inch deep stretcher, so it's kind of pushed off a bit. I don't think I have one here, um, but for some people, for some reason, people really love that. For beginners, uh, it is a great way to print your astrophotography because the imperfections in the canvas will hide the imperfections in your images. For the more advanced astrophotographers, you're probably going to hate it because it hides all of the detail in your images. Uh, so as I progressed a bit, um, I found myself moving more towards uh, printing on metal. And uh, the metal prints give you that luster of photographs. Uh, are impervious to basically damage and whatnot and uh don't uh you don't need to frame them so i find when you frame astrophotography uh you're you're you have to put glass in front of it uh that glass reflects a lot of the light off of the black background and just doesn't really do anything for the photos the uh metal prints which just i think i have one right here so i'll show it off really make a dramatic presentation uh, I see reflections in this but you actually don't notice the reflections uh, normally it's on metal just a thin piece of metal uh, all you do is you put a small nail in the wall they give you a bracket too I don't even use that you put a small nail in the wall holds it uh, my favorite way to uh, display my photography. No frame needed. Uh, so between between the cost of a frame and having a larger print printed, <coughs> you are almost at the same price as you would pay for the metal prints. Um, OK. <coughs> Moving on. Uh, we had covered one. Do you polar align to the pole or the refracted pole? I don't know. Let me think about that. If you're using a polar scope, you're polar aligning to the refracted pole. But if you're drift aligning, you're polar aligning on the actual pole, right? So I guess uh, it depends on your method. I don't know how far the the refracted pole is. I, I think the diff, diff the diffracted pole, correct? Um, I don't know. Anyone in the room know that? It, um, it, it depends on. You'll get different. Uh, depending on what pole you align to, whether it's a diffracted pole or the non diffracted pole. You're gonna optimize uh, like frame rotation or tracking, or one or the other, or one of the other various uh, defects that you get from tracking. That's how I understood it. As I understand it, um, it doesn't. It does. It's a good intellectual discussion, but when you get right down to it, most of us do some form of a drift alignment. Even if it's not the traditional old drift alignment, it's something along those lines where we, we watch a star moving it, like PhD is actually a drift alignment. It's just a computer-assisted drift alignment. And uh, I don't know where the polar stars would be or where the North Pole would be, whether it's refracted or, or absolute or anything like that. I just know whether or not the stars are holding still and not drifting north or south. Right. Yeah, it's and I'm, I'm as I think about it, I guess the I don't know how significant the diffraction is, but the diffraction is probably different at different uh, further north, right? If you're further north, there will be less diffraction, I think. I would think if you're if you're talking about the northern pole yeah. or the or, or Polaris, I should say. Um, but I don't know. You, you stumped me on that one. Uh, but like like further, Alex said, further south. Intellectual. Further south you are, it will refract more because it will be lower. Right. Polaris will be lower and it would refract more by the atmosphere. Right. Um, 
I would like to know the differences between the major focus drivers out there. Stars, uh, Starzona, uh, Ry Rigel, Moonlight, Focus Boss, etc. Um, There's a follow-up question with yeah, that. I know. I, I, see, I, can... I see people having a focuser from one manufacturer and a driver from a different one, and I'm wondering what the benefit is. Looking at getting a computerized focuser, and it's not exactly clear which direction to go, using a 10-inch SCT. Uh, and uh, he's talking about the motor control units. Um, so I'll give you my experience. Uh, I have a Moonlight uh, stepper focuser motor, and I'm using the Rigel uh, focuser controller. Um, I believe that they're the... Rigel controller is also capable of focusing another manufacturer, but I'm not 100% certain about that. But they, those two are compatible. Um, the reason they, I did that are is they stepper motors or do they? they're stepper motors. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, with a DC motor, it may not matter so much because it's either on or off. With the stepper motor, it's got to read back and forth the, the actual number uh, that it's at. Are, are you asking, um, what was the question, Chris P? Uh, Chris, are you asking the difference? Uh, are you asking what kind of focuser you should buy or have you I, already I that, decided to buy a, a particular, um, I mean, you, you should buy an absolute focuser. And I mean, we can tell you that, or, or, or have you already passed that stage and you want to know, you know, what are the, what are the different points between one focuser and another? Yeah, I think he's, because he did say currently using a 10 inch SCT, uh, looking to get a computerized focuser and not clear which direction to go. Um, so being that you have a 10 inch SCT, first of all, I'm going to assume 10 inch, it's a mead. Um, so uh, the focus, system in the mead uh i'm not experienced with it but from what i've heard uh has a lot less um uh mirror flex or, or mirror sag or whatever whatever it is uh fo yeah or even focus uh shift uh than the celestrons um so if you found that with your system then I would say a focuser that uh, a motorized focuser that goes on your knob might be your best option. Um, for a lot of us that use Celestrons, uh, we're going to put a Crayford style focuser on the rear of the tube uh, and lock down the mirrors. And what that does is that limits a lot of that uh, flop, um, which might make focusing a, a little bit easier. Now I will say it. I don't. I actually use a focuser that's on my um, at the time a focuser that was on my knob, uh, but that was one of the limitations of the system, and that's actually one of the things that caused me to move to an RC uh, because you have to use a Crayford on the back, and um, it gave me the opportunity to buy a super solid, rigid Moonlight focuser, Moonlight Crayford focuser, uh, or SCT focuser, uh, which uh, I could then attach the motor to. Uh, and since I didn't want to spend all that money and I already had the Rigel uh, controller, I was able to just hook it right up to that. Um, so, they are interchangeable in a few different ways. Uh, I know at least the Rigel and the Moonlights. Um, so you, do, you want me to, do you want me to speak a little bit about this? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. So th there are two types of uh, stepper motors, bipolar and uh, unipolar. So the, the moon, Moonlight, Rigel, and uh, so some of the few others are unipolar motors. So each other's controllers will be compatible with other. But like, for instance, like Focus Link's motor the the kind of um, focuser the focus links that kind of locks in those are uh, bipolar motors like then you couldn't use like a robofocus controller to run that motor but uh, like a focus boss controller or like a focus links control controller will run both type of motors 
with appropriate cable. Like you, you would need, to, you would have to get the right cable for the right motor. But like a Focus Lynx controller will run a bipolar and a unipolar motor, but not the other way around. So, so okay. that's why Moonlight, Rigel, and RoboFocus are pretty much all interchangeable. They all use uh, uni, uh, bi uh, unipolar motors. Right. And the only difficult thing about the Rigel to Moonlight, now I could have purchased one from Rigel, but uh, I decided to build my, what is it, a, a serial to uh, RJ45? I don't remember the specific wire, but basically it's it's like a telephone wire. I don't, I don't remember whether there were four or six wires. There might have been six wires. Uh, and basically, you have to make sure that the colors are lined up properly. So you're, you end up basically building um, a little, by, by putting the pins in the proper place, you build a little adapter, and then you can plug a telephone cable into it or an RJ45 cable into it, whatever it is. I forget the, I forget the name. A little bit later on, Linda Thomas Fowler asks, I have a related question. Oops, somebody flipped. With computerized focusers, are you adding a motor to your existing focuser or replacing the whole unit? Um, it, yeah, you could do any one of a number of options. So the first thing you have to ask is just how good is your current focuser? If you have a typical SCT, then you're gonna you're gonna have mirror uh, focus flop where uh, because you're trying to move the whole mirror at once. There are studies put out by RoboFocus, I know, that says that, oh, no, it works just as well either way. I don't know of anybody out in the field who believes that. Um, that um, So if you've got an SCT, you're probably talking about adding an auxiliary focuser on the back. And that's what Adam referred to earlier. Usually it's a Crayford focuser or maybe it's a rack and pinion focuser. The front end of the focuser matches the back end of your schmidt cassegrain and the back end has matches the front end of your camera um it's a you know a t48 mount or something like that okay so that's what you do if however you already own a really nice refractor you can sometimes and with a good solid focuser already um you can um oh by the way yes you can add a motor that just turns that focusing wheel. So you don't have to use your fingers to turn the focusing wheel on the schmidt cassegrain You can use the motor to do that. And those are the ones that I don't think most people are happy with in the long run. And that's why they add the auxiliary focuser on the back. Now, if you have a good telescope with a good, uh, you know, Crayford focuser on it or a good rack and pinion focuser on it, you can sometimes as, as simple as remove the knobs from it and replace it with a RoboFocus motor and various other people make those motors. Um, and um, then you get various software, RoboFocus makes it, and various other people make software for, to do this, that just reads the position of the, um, of the, uh, of the motor and uh, tells it to go forward or backwards and you use software to control that. So most cases, uh, um, and, and they, you interface the motor with the focuser either by screwing the motor right on with a little coupling bracket right on to, the, um, to where the knob used to be. Okay, you can, you can do that. In other cases, you can buy a whole integrated set where the motor is integrated into the new focuser and stuff like that. On my various imaging rigs I've got out there, I've got uh, probably two or three RoboFocus setups with various size couplings. And uh, I use it on several different refractors and several auxiliary focusers that are um, attached to the back of schmidt cassegrains and things like that. So that's you've got various choices, Linda. OK? Yep. Thank you. Um, Guillermo, uh, what do you think about the new triad filter made by OPT? It's a narrow band filter for color cameras. It looks interesting for deep sky imaging in the city. I want to say we discussed this a month ago or so, and um, someone correct me if, I, if I'm screwing this up, but basically, yes, it's a narrow band filter 
Uh, they say for color cameras, um, but basically I, I, I think rather than defining it as a narrow band filter for color cameras, I would say it's a light pollution filter that only uh, shows uh, H alpha O3 and S2, right? Or, or maybe it shows other wavelengths, but uh, it cuts out everything outside of those wavelengths. So if you're shooting a galaxy, for example, for it, uh, you're not going to get anything. So it's not an effective light pollution filter for shooting galaxies, but it would be an effective light pollution filter for shooting nebula. Um, and they define it as one that would work with color cameras, which I can kind of see. But to me, what I wonder then is, uh, I wonder if this wouldn't be an appropriate um, luminance filter for shooting narrowband. Um, if that's your thing, I don't know. I, 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 it's new, so who knows how people are going to use it. But uh, it seemed interesting. There are a few people interested in it in the room. Um, another one of those things interesting in theory we have to see how in practice it uh, it actually performs um, but that's what I've heard of it um, and then you notice it costs what is it six hundred and seventy dollars or something like that it costs a heck of a lot of money so um, and you know what's funny is that when I first heard about it I said whoa what a fantastical idea and that was mid-September, and um, we haven't heard of it since. You know, I, on cloudy nights, I haven't seen anybody say, hey, look what I got with my new um, uh, filter from OPT. I haven't seen any of that. So I don't know what's happening with it. I suppose I could walk down the way at the observatories out at GMARS and ask Chris, who's one of the people who's pushing the thing, and um, Chris Hendricks, and uh, ask him how's it going and stuff like that. But I don't know. I haven't done that. I I don't see what this is talking about. This particular question, uh, a bit confused. I guess you want to be between one and two. That the that that's with Pam um, about picking pixel size coverage. I think is it Pam M. Yeah, I, I honestly don't see. Yeah, the I'm question. not sure that we haven't covered it a little bit later in text. Okay. It, she's asking what size pixel coverage should she buy for her telescope, and the answer is you always try to get about half of your scene, so that uh, every every star is on at least two different pixels, um, and it makes for nicer, prettier stars. And stuff like that but the answer is also that you know you only got so much control over that because some nights are, are better seeing than other nights and and you're you know you're gonna buy how many cameras and how many tubes well it's gonna mix and match and, and then well you know you can also bin is another way to get more coverage and things like that and if you're buying CMOS with the they're getting a little or little <coughs> sensors they're a little or little pixels you may not you know you simply may not have much of a choice so uh, do what you can, but don't go don't go crazy trying to match them up perfectly. Things change, and I think we covered that in text yeah. later on. I think so. Um, By the way, I want to say something about the text. Somebody asked this at the end of the last session, and all, there's an awful lot of stuff going on over in the comment section. If you are commenting over in YouTube year by yourself nobody's going to comment with you because um, we don't monitor that and you may have somebody else over there and you may be having a wonderful conversation and go for it if that's what you like but if you want to get in the big conversation over here uh, come on over to the astroimaging channel.com and, and hook that up now having hooked it up um, when you're finished um, click on it and the second icon across the bottom over the left side allows you to export the conversation as an HTML, HTML file. And it um, lets you save all the different wonderful things that people have been saying and asking about and stuff like that. So please take advantage of that. And for those of you who unfortunately have to work or sleep or in a different time zone entirely and can't see us till tomorrow, 
I wish there were a way, Adam, that we could somehow figure out how to save these things so people could look through the comments from time to time, too. Well, I've been saving them, so I'll just keep saving them, and then I'll try and post them in uh, okay. Google Drive in the description of the YouTube. Okay. Um, so just have to do that. Um, speaking of comments, Jeff Boyd just asked, speaking of comments, are these comments archived somewhere? I didn't see them. Jeff... Yeah, Last two weeks. That's the answer we just talked about. Um, I just, oh, I hate it when the comments jump around. Uh, yeah, well, okay, he's just wondering why people choose different labels, leaning towards Moonlight, but not sure which driver. Um, well, I, I will say this. The, the Moonlight controller units are, it, it, actually, I'll say Moonlight builds great products. You know, they have uh, the machinery to uh, custom make all of that stuff. And they just, I don't know, you get a beautiful, nice, shiny package. Um, the rivals are more primitive. Um, it's, it's a motor on a bracket on a gear. And uh, if you want to be focusing for, I don't know, uh, $300, auto-focusing for $300, then Rigel's probably the way to go. Uh, if you, if you want to spend seven or eight or $900, then or more, then the Moonlight may be the way to go. It's basically and, just what you want to spend. And I think, what is it, 495 nowadays for, I don't really know because I haven't bought one in years, uh, for a RoboFocus, um, which well, the nice thing about it is with a little ingenuity, you can adapt it to almost anything. You just have to figure out how to bend little pieces of metal to um, and attach it to the focusing uh, knobs. Okay. Ding and dang, it's all over the board here, isn't it? It's like all. All right, okay, I'm going to read this out without, any, uh, without knowing the answer yet. Okay, can we process two subs? series all together of the exact same deep sky object taken using the exact same gear but one set of subs was taken in florida and the other set was captured in portland if yes what might be the caveats or issues we may encounter while doing a comprehensive processing workflow if the answer is no can you explain why so adam i, I did answer that one in the stream uh, later on um so so Ultimately, the answer is yes. There's there's no reason you can't in integrate data from multiple locations. I, I think someone might be worried about something like parallax, but realistically, the difference between objects is so tiny um, that you know even when we use the Earth at different you know six month apart orbit points, right? Even our most advanced telescopes can only see parallax differences up to maybe a you know a thousand light years or something like that, right? So. Um, you know, it's it's just not really possible that you're going to see a lot of difference with amateur equipment. Uh, so there's no limiting factor other than the equipment itself. So the things you might run into are uh, light pollution differences, uh, gradient differences, things like this. Um, so those can impact how you do your processing. Or if you're using two different setups at those different locations, say you're working with someone else, that brings additional complications depending on the actual equipment um, so that that gets into some fairly advanced processing uh, and how you deal with multiple different setups um, but um, ultimately there's no limitation to, to combining few, the data a few years ago at AIC the advanced imaging conference in San Jose Rob Gendler did a presentation about how he takes some pictures and then he takes pictures from the Hubble archive where you can actually go and get the original plates the original uh, uh, files of the Hubble shots and uh, he uses Hubble shots and uh, shots from other, you know, Palomar and those, okay. he puts them all together into one big image you know, using the best parts of each one and things like that. And uh, obviously much more complicated than, than what we're just talking about here. You're talking about you know, like a few people in different parts of the world all collaborating on the same image. And yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Josh and David and you guys, you guys all did that not too long ago, right? 
um, they were yeah. all taking pictures of the same object and sending them into each other. And Josh was going to get them processed up or something. I don't remember. Yeah, that, that, that was going to be my answer. Was uh, well, I didn't understand the question at first, but absolutely, you can process uh, images from different locations, and you should uh, because you should practice collaborating. In fact, that is probably the thing that uh, made us all that much better because um, you really if you can take different image sets and take the best aspects of E and process them together uh, and maintain those good aspects then you've got a good image that's and you've done a good job processing um, and somebody's noticed that QHY has a new focus or controller driver on Astro Factor's website for $150. Um, we had mentioned the uh, the difference, the, the two different types of stepper controllers, but I don't know if we specifically mentioned that there are two different types of um, controller motors, a controller mo uh, and motors. A DC or stepper. Uh, DC is basically on off. Uh, so it's either it's like saying, uh, hey, you're going to turn the knob to the right, turn, 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 turn. Uh, or, hey, you're going to turn the knob to the left, turn, 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 turn. Whereas a stepper motor is going to say, you're going to turn to the right 100 steps. And it's going to precisely turn 100 steps, which represents a very, very tiny amount. Um, so it's very, very precise and very repeatable which is the key to a stepper motor. So if that, um, so there are a lot of motors in that price range that are DC motors. If that is a stepper motor for $150, then that's a great deal. And if it works, it's gonna be a hot product, but I'm not familiar with it. So that's basically uh, what, uh, what I have to say. And uh, Martin's saying he remembers, who wants to go deep on the tadpoles? I remember that. Um, was that a Mad Ratter post? Uh, but we all did it. Uh, a collaboration. Um, that was, wow, like five, six, seven years ago or something. Um, a collaboration on the tadpoles. And uh, we basically processed all of our data together. And I want to say that was before, well, I know that was before I was kind of I'm not gonna before I'm not gonna say before I was good but before I really knew enough about doing it to uh, process it appropriately but oh not that long ago maybe three maybe three years I guess so time flies um, Adam I, yeah. I think reading through the comments in the section I I think we covered uh, we tried to touch on almost everything there was uh, Renan asked, it seems exposure time been used for getting our lights are determined by evaluating somehow these lights. Um, oh, how do you, de how, you know, what, the, let's, let's everybody just kind of make a suggestion as to what they use to determine what the proper exposure is. I think we've been through this in various places, but uh, the, it's a question that continuously pops up. So, um, how how do you determine what the proper exposure should be? I think that's so, what it's asking. So, I have used the calculators before and determined that uh, I want to hit an ADU value of uh, a background sky ADU value of three thousand. Um, so, when I'm uh, so. Let's say I go out and uh, I notice the moon happens to be very bright. Uh, then, uh, or the moon's out and I'm shooting RGB. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Um, so I can take my test exposure and I'll take my exposure for a minute. And let's say the background ADU value is 2000. Well, I know that my camera has a um, uh, an automatic uh 1080 u in there uh it just puts that in there to to uh prevent future math problems a, a kind of a pedestal um so the background sky that brought me up to 2000 over that one minute uh if i were to go two minutes because my camera's linear it should double and i should be at 3000 so 
I basically kind of use that in my mind, but I also try and keep my numbers round. So that's basically how I do it. Uh, if it's closer to 300, I'll use 300. If it's closer to 140, I'll use 140. Um, but uh, if, I, if I shot last night and I'm shooting tonight, sky conditions are probably the same. If it's two weeks apart and the moon conditions are different, then uh, I'll probably sw be switching my exposure times. That makes sense. Yeah, it does to me. I, um, many of us assume that we'd like. Um, oh, here's a, here's a question for you, Adam. Why did you decide three thousand is your ideal? Um, okay, so why did I decide three thousand? Um, <clears throat> I think that actually came from a calculator. Uh, so basically, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the um, calculator asks me for my bias pedestal, um, my camera's specified read noise, my camera's specified dark current. I believe it asks me for, uh, and then it tells me where roughly I should be, so that the read noise only represents uh, five percent of the right. background sky. Um, okay. Now that, it asks that, that three thousand number is um, an ideal for a certain camera, certain sensor type, but for a different sensor type, it's thirteen fifty. Like on a five eighty three, I think it's thirteen fifty. And when we're talking about background noise, what you uh, what you background ADU, what you do is you open up a part a, a picture that you've taken, and you you go over and click on a certain area of the picture, and it will uh, out a dark sky where there are no nebulosity and no bright stars or anything, and that background sky will give you a value. And what you have to do is is do what Adam says. You subtract the pedestals, which are included in your dark and your bias, and that'll give you a number. And, and the way most of us do it is by using a calculator at Star Arizona, uh, at uh, CCD Ware, and various other places you can find these calculators. And um, uh, that's how we decided. Does that answer your question, Renan? Or is there, did you want us to go more into depth? Oh, and by the way, it really dramatically changes if you want to take something besides what we're talking about, deep spot, deep space on a fairly dark night. If you want to take um, the double cluster, you may have a different answer because you want the color in the stars and the formulas that we just talked about might have given you burned out stars. So um, you don't want to go there, but that's something you have to decide as to what you want to take, okay? And maybe some of the other guys in the room can make suggestions as to what they do. Or maybe they don't want to. I don't know. Is it OK to use ABE or DBE? Um, uh, ABE, automatic background extraction, DBE, dynamic background extraction, uh, on individual images, LRGB before LRGB combination. Uh, it is OK. Uh, but I do believe that. Uh, when you do it on an RGB image, it splits the channels anyway. Um, so unless the gradients between your individual, ch uh, let me think about that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there'd be any benefit because it's basically just the sample. It would be more about if the samples you're taking aren't appropriate for a certain image, but I can't imagine why it wouldn't be. Um. Um, so, so Adam, I've, yeah. I've done some of this before, and um, the way DBE works, uh, whenever you create the, the desktop icon, it locks in the samples on whatever reference frame you used. So if you have dithering or some sort of drift or something like that, stars and other objects can migrate over to where the samples are from whatever reference frame you used. And so your results may not be what you expect when you're doing your DBE process. It's generally why I use AB if I'm doing something like that. Uh, and it can actually yield some pretty good results if you have some some data that's really you're really struggling with and you want you've got a kind of simple gradient per each frame, but they're complex after the final stacking and they're difficult to remove. Maybe you got a lot of nebulosity or something like that. Then actually doing the ABE per subframe can sometimes yield a better result um, you know, before you actually integrate. 
Um, but the, he, uh, go ahead. He's saying before LRGB combination. So I'm assuming that's uh, after registration, right? He's saying before okay. LRGB combination. Oh, yeah. He's saying not before integration. I see. In which case, it is it different? Um, it could be a little different before LRGB combination because the the LRG combine LRGB combine is nonlinear. Um, so, if you do an RGB and then you combine luminance with it, then you would do ABE on luminance in your RGB um, or DB or whatever you're going to do. Um, if you're doing it okay, yeah. otherwise, I, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Um, yeah, no, it makes sense kind of on the luminance a little bit, doing the luminance separate from the RGB maybe. Yeah. In general, when I'm processing my data, that's what I, I do. I, I, I process luminance and RGB entirely separately, mm -hmm. right? And so I would do an ABE or DBE on each of those uh, before I do any kind of combination with them. Well, truth be told, I do that too, but I'm doing it on narrowband images mostly. Right. Uh, it, it, would, it would seem to me that the best time to do that if you're gonna be doing that is, is you've got an individual red, green, and a blue, and uh, you run the, run the background equalization, or the, the um, ABE, um, on each of those separate ones so that you remove any peculiar uh, gradients that came from white pollution or something like that. It could very well be that because of the sequence, the way you took it, that you took your, um, you, well, it was pointing one way, you took the reds and then, then you did a meridian flip and you know, uh, light pollution and um, stuff like that. Uh, you know, you may have left it behind three or four hours ago when you're up in a different part of the sky. And so uh, that, that's, you'd have to play it by ear, but there's nothing mathematically or anything that says you can't run it just before or, or after or anything like that. It does work well early in the process, uh, background extraction. Yeah. So no, no harm in doing it that way. I, I've never run into problems doing it after. There is, like I said, the, the LRGB combination is nonlinear. So there's, I'd say a theoretical possibility that doing it after could have issues, but I've never actually run into an issue doing it. So take that for what it is, right? Oh. All right. Yep, and he's saying he's getting better results doing it that way. So mm -hmm. uh, do it the way that you get better results. <laughs> and remember, every piece of advice you get on the astroimaging channel is worth what you paid for it. <laughs> if, if it's on the internet, it has to be true. Uh -huh. I think we got all yeah, because he's, he's dealing with heavy light pollution. Um, uh, Jeff is dealing with heavy light pollution. So yeah, uh, so a complex gradient. Uh, oh, okay. So he's saying he needs to do individual DBE before stacking probably because of the complex gradient. That's complex gradient and more of a complex issue. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was talking about before. I, I, I got it mixed up. Uh, yeah. I thought I thought John was asking about that, but he's just asking about L and RGB. Right, right. Awesome. Well, I th this was another one. Uh, we commented earlier, we don't have a topic for tonight. Well, sometimes these sessions turn out well and sometimes they don't, but... Uh, I don't know when we cover a lot of questions like this, and I think give some good answers. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I look at them as being somewhat successful. That said, we are always still looking for presenta uh, presenters. Um, so if you're available, uh, let me know. Deconvolution and narrowband. I'll give one more question. Do you guys decon all of your channels or just H alpha? Um, very few exceptions to, uh, I would do just H alpha with very few exceptions. I think uh, I've done deconvolution on the, the O3 and the Crescent Nebula. 
uh, to try and give it a little bit more sharpness. Um, can I think of another object? I don't know any, uh, the reason it would have been that one is because it's very strong in O3. Um, I'm trying to think of another strong O3 object that I would really want to get a lot of detail out of, or maybe, uh, maybe just, uh, kind of sharpen the, uh, the transitions, um, but nothing is popping into my head right now. You know what you should do in a lot of these questions? Um, decon you know, decon deconvolve all of them and, and see what kind of results you get. And then just do it with the hydrogen alpha and see which, because uh, a lot of these things, it may be just your taste and, and you certainly need to know this answer for yourself. So, um, I, you know, why don't you do that and, and tell us what you find that uh, is useful on it. Yeah. In, in general, though, I will say uh, yeah. uh, the H alpha is going to be where a lot of your detail and structures are going to come from, uh, yeah. only with a few exceptions, uh, maybe a dozen co popular objects, um, maybe some planetary nebula. Uh, planetary nebula, there you go, there's an example. Uh, I would bet there's a lot of planetary nebula with O3 that you can use deconvolution on to get a little bit more detail out of. Um, uh, now, I'll add a that. slight twist to this, Adam, um, which is that I tend to use deconvolution on all the channels so that my stars match up in sharpness <laughs> appropriately. Okay. Um, and I'll protect the background of the O3 and the S2 very heavily because you're right, the it tends to be where there's almost no structure in them. They'll be very faint relative to the HA. Most of your details going to come from the HA. So I'll protect the background very heavily, but allow more process to work on the stars so I get effectively the same star sharpness between the HA, O3, and S2. Um, so you're, 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 masking, you're masking the reverse of what you normally would. And not really a reverse. I just uh, attenuate the non-star portion very heavily. So that it, how, do you, how do you do that? With a mask? <clears throat> yes, with a mask. So normally I would use a, uh, an inverted mask you know, for the, the deconvolution process and then use a star mask on top of that specifically for the process that helps control the, the ringing around the stars. Um, so I would go through and um, allow, uh, take the star mask and subtract it from that and then cut the intensity back a bit, right? So that way the overall brightness of the whole structure and background is lower and the stars are still cut out pretty well around there so that they can still be worked on some amount. Right. I think, I think you did a show on this. Uh, did I? Well, I did one on deconvolution and stuff. I don't remember if I did that specifically, but... Um, well, Adam, explain did a show. I think most people would know, but there may be some people. I was at a, a seminar yesterday with 20-some people in the room, and uh, most of them astro-imagers, and um, somebody was talking about the astro-imaging channel because they wanted to remind me that 3 times 3 is not 11, like I had in my statistics presentation. So we, I had to explain that that um, because of rounding, in this case it was. But at any rate, um, Fully half the people did not know about the S2 Imaging Channel, and some may be joining us for the first time today. So tell them where our, our old programs are. How many have we got? 125, 150 of them? I'm not program? even sure off the top of my head, but it's got to be that many. Uh, possibly possibly 150 plus, right? Probably doing well, it. Is this, is this three full years we've done this, or is, are we coming up on the third year? I am not 100% sure. Anyway, uh, where, where, where can one find uh, our so, right? shows? Um, so you can go to our website, theastroimagingchannel.com, click on videos, and you can browse through those 150 or so videos. Uh, <clears throat> that can be a little bit difficult. So if you do want to just search for our videos, uh, your, best, uh, your best place to do that is on YouTube. And... Um, or you can search the Astro Imaging Channel uh, dot com, or excuse me, the Astro Imaging Channel, and say you want to learn about deconvolution. Deconvolution. 
Uh, you want to learn about wide field imaging, wide field imaging. Uh, Google will get you to the videos. YouTube search will get you to the videos. Um, they may get you a lot of other people's videos, too. They're going to get you to a lot of other vid people's videos, too. That's why if you put the Astro Imaging channel uh, in there, uh, it'll get you to ours. Uh, it'll give it the keywords. Uh, it needs to get you to the right spot. We don't have a search on our website yet. Uh, unfortunately, the way the uh, uh, videos are displayed don't allow us to search through them from our website. Uh, it's all just kind of fed in from YouTube. Um, so hopefully that'll get you to, that'll get you to them. What we need is a groupie that was going to watch all the shows and identify ten keywords from each show and make a massive data database that's searchable for everybody. So if there are any groupies out there that want something to do, that would be a wonderful project for you. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, <clears throat> we went. Uh, went over by a little bit, a little bit longer than I was expecting, but that's good because it was an open session, and if we keep going on, then that means we were talking about good stuff. Hey, uh, Adam. Yes. Uh, I set up a, a little demonstration of the uh, star removal, if you want to see okay. it. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay. So um, I guess i got to share my screen. <laughs> yep. Hover over to the left. Oh, you got it. Got it? Okay. Yep. So basically, <clears throat> here I have the the main finished image. It's I mean it's a work in progress, so excuse the crudity of it. Um, is it big enough to see? Uh, we we can see the stars. I don't know uh, what how how much detail you're gonna show off okay. in it. I'll zoom in a little bit there. Okay. All right. So here's the the image, and you start with that. Next, you go to creating a star mask, right? So I have these settings. Uh, the only thing that's important here really is uh, your noise threshold and that you have uh, your large scale structure growth increased because otherwise normally the larger stars don't go away. <clears throat> so you have to make sure you have that and that you have all the, the, the small stars and you're getting a good mask. So let me match this to this and Put it over here and you can see the stars, uh, even the tiny ones, are being represented in this image. So there's my initial star mask. And at that point, what you need to do is binarize it because defect map, which is the last process here, only works with values of zero. So any pixel value that has zero um, will result in the defect map uh, eliminating that star. So as you can see here, these stars uh, don't have values of zero. That's at 6,000 or 60,220. Not even the not even the big stars are saturated. So that's a problem. So we take the binarize and we run a binarize on it. The thing with binarize here, still preview, Okay, so my values here are way, way too high. So take the threshold even further than this. If you go any further than this with the slider, it goes to zero. So I, go, I come in here, turn that into a zero, and come way over here, and maybe turn that into a nine. And let's see, that preview is I caught a little, a few more stars here. <clears throat> so this is a, the preview of the binarized star mask here. And that's about as good as it's going to get. So I will now apply that to the star mask. Uh oh, what's going on? Let me try that again. Apply. Okay. Now it's applied. So there's my star mask at the same here, three to one scale as this. And I'll use that star mask in the defect map as the defect map. All the other settings are default. And then grab this and apply it to the image. Oh, I missed a step. If you see it, you see how it's sitting here? It looks like it's not doing nothing and I have a slow computer. Uh, that's not a, the case. I don't have a slow computer. What I forgot to do, you need to invert these because the defect map 
like I said before, uses zero pixels as defects. So it's looking at all this background as a defect. Well, we don't want that, so you need to invert the image like that. And then you can apply the defect map to the image. That goes a lot faster. It's applying to, on a per channel basis, three channels. And there it is. So you can see, even at this scale, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. That's that's at a, a one to two scale. So there's a one to one scale. It does pretty good. And I just whipped this up pretty quickly. But the more time you spend using, uh, the more time you spend generating your star mask and binarizing it <clears throat> to get uh, to get a really something that really works well. I mean, this is a rough mask, but you can see already with very little effort, you can come up with a really decent star removal uh, technique. That, that was very effective. Yeah. Now, I think you can uh, do the binarization right inside of the star mask tool, right? You check binarize, and then the smoothness would be the threshold. I don't know. Um, I, now, it takes a long time. So I actually thought to myself, oh, well, if you make a star mask, then you binarize it in the second step, it might actually go quicker because uh, it does take a long time to generate those star masks, but I'm not quite sure about that. But you're, you, you can do it in one step, maybe with some... Uh, maybe with some bi oh, yeah, you can binarize in here. That's right. Well, yeah. is that a binarize... Is this a binarize on the final result? I think it is, isn't it? So, I well, think that binarize is different. I think that binarize is uh, determining where the cutoff effectively where the cutoff is. is. What is yeah. detected as a star and what is not. It's well, either a zero or one, not a gradient. Let me, let me just try that here. I'll, yeah. I'll do it with the binarize checked and see the results of the star mask. I, I think you're right, though, Dave. No, it does. It actually binarizes the, the results. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I, the smoothness is the threshold, then. OK, so look, look at the I, edges of the stars. Are they actually? Um, no. There it is. But that yeah. might you know that might work as well. So let's let's see how that works. So here's star mask one. I'll turn this into star mask one and then uh, apply it. It should work. Uh, you know, it's a little. It, it kind of shrunk the uh, the stars because here the fringes of the stars are are not zeros. Yeah, so, and it's hard to say how that far well, that fringe goes in too. That doesn't make sense because then it's not actually binarized, right? Yeah. No, it's it, it's what David said, uh, Alex or um, um, Adam. It. it uh, the binarize in the star mask process determines the cutoff for the star mask. Because binarizing whether the star is truly detected or not, and it's the same intensity uh, across the field. If you look at the, the star mask without it generated, all those stars will be effectively varying brightness in the star mask, whereas in the binarize, they'll all effectively be the same brightness level if they're detected. Okay, okay. So it's not exactly the same. Um, it may make it a little bit easier to catch the fainter stars doing it this way with the binaries on. But mm -hmm. uh, well, the results uh, obviously you'd have to tweak the mask a little bit. The results of the initial of your initial demonstration, though, seem to be a lot better. Yeah, uh, using the tool, the using the binarized tool. Yeah. So, so if I use the original mask. You get it. Oop, I got it backwards. I need to flip my mask. So if I invert the mask, your mask should look like this. I mean, what typically, what do people use to normally remove stars like that? See, these. this mask is way too large. Mm -hmm. You see that? So yeah. maybe my large scale growth is a little too high on, I'm gonna create a new mask. 
So I'm going to have a store mask and I'm going to do large scale growth, set it down to, I don't know, try one. It's all, you know, give and take. You got to try it. So apply that again to the original image or the final image. So you get your star mask. And actually, I had binarized, so I don't want that. Let's try this. All right. So now we can binarize that. That value is way too high, so let's put up like a nine in here. Try a nine. I'm a little smaller. Let's try a nine in this position. Okay, we'll go with that. And then apply the star mask. Oh, I have forgot to invert it again. Invert and apply. Yeah, that's a little better. Still, still a little large, but uh, well, see, see now the bigger stars here <clears throat> got left out a little bit. Well, it's all a matter of tweaking, but this yeah, is you got to tweak. So, or you know, you can also you can also run it twice. There, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. Just create different star masks at different scales, and you, you know, use them as different defect masks and keep applying the defect map over and over again because you're not degrading any of the other detail in the image. You know, the only thing that gets degraded are is anything that you see in black here. Right? So, Sal, what you're effectively doing is you're using the defect map to average in the area of your mask to whatever was outside of that mask you know, around the local area, right? Right. Right. That's why these look like they're just blurs because what it right. did is it took that it took that big area and said this is a defect. And what the defect ma map does is as I understand it, it'll take the pixels around that defect and say, what's the average value of that of that uh, area? In fact, I think it's a little more uh, sophisticated than that. You can see there's some color variation and some some uh, intensity variation inside the the defect correction. Yes, because it's gonna it's it's pulling from the edges effectively, and those edges will bleed in a little bit from the different edge that you're on. Correct. Right. Correct. So, and, and I suppose if you didn't want such a sharp transition here at the edges, you could probably mitigate some of that effect, some of that those sharp edges by using a mask in this image before you apply the defect map. You could have your star mask in the uh, inverted uh, position, your, or the star mask as you have it inverted like this applied to your image. Um, well, yes. But that, your, yeah, you want the original version that has the original, before not the binary. Binary. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly, that would work perfectly. Yeah. And with maybe a little curves uh, or, or uh, histogram, adjustment well the, does the defect map work a lot like morphological transformation because I see structure there I'm assuming if you drop that structure box down it's gonna say uh, circle and uh, oh here yep yeah. oh maybe yeah. that's maybe that's what uh, I haven't I haven't experimented I this is a uh, very early stages of <laughs> let's try circular. Let's see what happens. You, you might try instead of median, try a Gaussian with circle, uh, Gaussian? structure of circle. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. But in, in any case, ultimately, what you're trying to do is average in, right? So, so you said Gauss, Gaussian? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you can get the same effect. Uh, I think you know when I do star removal. It's mostly about the star mass. Once you get the star mass right, then MMT or convolution or any of those things will effectively do this to a certain extent. Right. Right. So you know, I don't. I don't. I didn't. I haven't. I don't see a difference there. Yeah. I don't know. I think I, with I, your 
with your defects being so large, it may not show any difference. Oh, I see. Because normally it's it's operating on a defect that's a single pixel and just getting you know the surrounding eight or so right pixels outside of that defect region. You know, um, I, I suppose the the better approach might be to do this before uh, you stretch it, do it in linear state. You know what I'm saying? I don't have a linear image here. Well. That might handy. be hard. That might be hard to pull off in the linear state. I don't know. Why is that? I don't know. I'm wondering how easy it's going to be to remove the stars without any uh, residuals linear, and then when you stretch it, not have residuals pop out. Well, why don't I take this to the linear state? Uh, where is where am I? History Explorer. I'll take that to right here with no n with no um, noise reduction, <clears throat> just a plain linear image, right? Let's do a star mask on this. I'm gonna have to reduce my noise threshold here. You could. Uh, you could use the same star mask, right? No, because the star mask would. Oh no, you were, no, right, right, right. Okay. The whole point of this is to have less of a defect area, so that the the corrections uh, yeah. come out a lot cleaner. All right, so that is not going to work. Let's go to O three. Oh. How low do I got to go? A one? Always threshold? Yeah, I mean, it's linear, so it's going to be low down there. Um, I would actually take the uh, I'm not getting it. Take a copy of the image, uh, a duplicate of the image, and then temporarily stretch it. Boost and, it a and, little bit, but not as much. Yeah, is what you're saying. Yeah, you know okay. what I'm going to say is uh, this is kind. This is an interesting uh, topic, but we could go on like this for an hour, yeah, uh, or longer, and maybe we will sometime. But uh, why don't you refine your technique, and uh, one of these days we'll we'll kind of go over it all. Yeah, sounds good. Sound like a plan. Sounds all right. good. Thing. Thanks well, for watching. No problem. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. I think it was a good episode because I'm getting at least one comment that it was a good episode. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm even going to push that last question off because it is getting late. The time change is killing me. And uh, even though tomorrow's my day off, I have to go into work. So uh, poor me. <laughs> that said, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, good night. Uh, see you all next week. Night, everybody.